I'm going to invite you to take a seat and grab your Bible or your Bible app and turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 5 is our text. If you're in the room and you don't have a Bible with you, that's perfectly fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1162 and you'll be able to follow along with the text. And as always, if you're here and you don't have a Bible and you want one, take one with you. It is our gift to you. Uh, and, and if you're joining us online, thank you for joining us. And if you don't have a Bible and you want one, message the online host, email the church office, give us a call. We'll get a Bible to you, whether we mail it to you or hand deliver it to you, because we want everyone to have the Word of God and read the Word of God, because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Hey, I want to briefly uh, reinforce what Pastor Robert shared about the Next Steps classes this afternoon. Everybody has a next step. Uh, and if you're following Jesus, then, then you're called to take that next step in following him. We want to help you do that. So if, you, if you're new to Calvary, you've never taken any of our classes, show up today and take intro, 6 o'clock in this room. Uh, if you want to learn how to grow spiritually, take grow. If you want to learn uh, you know, about serving our community, then take serve. If you want to you know, learn about leading Calvary, take lead. By the way, lead starts at 3 o'clock this afternoon. So if you got to do that, see me after the service because uh, uh, I'm, I'm teaching that one. But uh, we want you to take that next step. And, and for those of you that are like, well, I haven't really ever committed to following Jesus, we want you to take that next step too. Uh, and, and today, uh, even though we're talking about marriage and, and, and relationships, we want you to have that life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ because there's nothing else as important as that. And we, in fact, we'd love for you today to make that decision to follow Jesus and next week get baptized at the lake because that would be kind of a cool one-two punch to, you know, to this world. So um, uh, that's just my encouragement to you to take that next step. We are continuing our marriage series and, uh, and, and by the way, if you're not married, it's still for you. I know some of you, I had some comments last week uh, from some of the widows saying this was really hard, from some people saying it's not for me. And the truth is, if you're married, it's for you. If you're in a relationship, it's for you. If you are thinking that one day you would like to get married, it's for you. If, uh, if that's in the realm of the possibility, then what we're talking about relationships applies to you. But if you're at that point where you're like, hey, I'm too old and I'm alone and I'm not going to go down that road again, it's still for you. Everything we teach has to do about relationships and, and relationships applies whether it's marriage, friendships, family, work, uh, those principles still apply and, and they will help change your relational dynamic. Uh, and the other thing is if you think you're old and beyond the uh, ever getting married again stage, you know people who are married or who are thinking about getting married and hopefully when you have an opportunity to speak into their life, you'll speak God's wisdom into their life because you'll understand it. And you'll be a source of hope and encouragement and not somebody who's like, yeah, I wouldn't do that if I were you. Uh, <laughs> so we are in a marriage series. Uh, and uh, last week, Pastor Joe showed up to kick off our marriage series. If you weren't here, uh, he did a great job talking about to love and to cherish. You should watch the video. But if you missed it, he was wearing a tuxedo. <laughs> and as I watched him come out in a tuxedo, I was like, I can't compete with that. I can't compete with Joe's sartorial splendor, so I will just mock it. Uh, and that's what I did. So this is as classy as I get. Uh, and uh, and some, some people ask me, go, where'd you get that? And I go, have you not heard of Amazon? Uh, so anyway, hey, I first met my wife, Meralda, in the spring of 1977. Uh, it was at our church in Tempe, Arizona. She was walking by, and I thought, oh, who's the new girl? Uh, we attended high school and youth group together, uh, though she wasn't really attracted to me in those early days, as evidenced by her turning me down for high school homecoming dance three years in a row. But we began dating the summer of 1980. See, she took me to her senior prom. Uh, we never, uh, we stopped, started dating in summer of 1980, never stopped, got engaged uh, about two and a half years later, got married in May of 1984, and uh, one week after I graduated from college. And after dating for almost four years, knowing each other for seven years, literally growing up together, we of course had the perfect marriage from the start. I mean, we never argued, neither of us ever got angry, and life was never ending bliss. And then we woke up the second day of our marriage. Uh, <laughs> see, the truth is, about six weeks into the marriage, I had an, uh, 
an, an honest and uh, uncomfortable complaining conversation with God about this woman that he gave me. See, marriage wasn't nearly as fun and blissful as I had imagined it should be. I mean, she had the audacity to have her own opinions. I mean, she did not wake up happy and beautiful with fresh breath. And can you imagine she did not even want to fulfill my every desire? And I prayed, God, what have I done? And that is when God rebuked me. Now, I don't know about you guys, but when God rebukes me, I don't hear an audible voice, but I get this real strong feeling. And the feeling I got was, Chad, my son, you're such an idiot. <laughs> and so God began uh, teaching me what I want to share with you, some of what I want to share with you today, what we've learned about through 37 years of marriage, uh, raising two daughters, uh, and having four and three-quarter grandchildren uh, and 40 years of ministry as a couple. So it all begins with understanding this reality. You have the choice to make the relationship better or worse. You have the choice to make the relationship better or worse. Now, uh, if you're like me, at some point you got married, you stood in front of a crowd of people, uh, there was a minister on stage, maybe it was a smaller crowd, but, you know, we were in church, and we stood there, I could tell you all about all the funny things that happened in our wedding, but that, I don't have time for that. But uh, I said something like this, I, Chad, take the Imerelda to be my wedded wife, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish as long as we both shall live. And, and, I, as, and I've performed hundreds of weddings uh, since that day, and and what I realized is a lot of those are conditions that we don't really have a lot of control over. I mean, richer or poor, you know, you can work really hard, but, you know, bad stuff can happen. Sickness and in health, I mean, you know, you start off young and seemingly healthy, but, you know, diseases happen, accidents happen, infirmities happen because we live in a sinful, broken world, and all of us are hurtling toward death. Uh, so, I mean, you don't have a lot of control over that. But richer, or, but... Uh, Better or worse, even though it's, you know, originally written to talk about whether life is good or life is bad based on circumstances and stuff like that, I realized you always have the choice to make your marriage better or worse. You always have the decision, the choice to make your relationships better or worse. Ephesians 5 is a lengthy passage about marriage. The Apostle Paul kind of goes on his marriage rant, and I want us to look at one verse toward the end of it. Ephesians 5:28 as kind of the key verse of this thought today. Paul says, In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. He who loves his wife loves himself. Paul, once again, is leaning into the biblical principle of reciprocity. Now, if you aren't familiar with the biblical principle of reciprocity, it means that you reap what you sow. Okay, you reap what you sow. And, and if you read the New Testament at all, you're going to find that that principle is woven into the teachings of Jesus and Paul and Peter. If you read the Old Testament, you're going to find it there because uh, it, it's built into the fabric of this world that we live in. It's built into the fabric of the universe. You are going to reap what you sow. And this is especially powerfully true in your marriage and in your relationships. You're going to get back what you put into it. So the husband who loves his wife will receive love. The wife who loves her husband is going to receive love. The husband who blesses his wife is going to get blessed. The wife who blesses her husband will be blessed. Now, of course, because we are in a sinful world, and this is a principle, there are exceptions. So people uh, can break their uh, marriage vows. They can break their promises. They can betray. They can abuse. They can abandon. That's, that's possible. But you can't control what somebody else does, but you have a choice to make for you. See, a lot of times we look at the other person in the relationship and think that it's all about them. That's what I was doing when I cried out to God, what have I done? I was looking at everything that Merelda was doing, and I wasn't happy with that, and I thought it was her fault, and she needed to change. And God said, no, you're the idiot. You need to change. You need to make it better, not worse. You have that power to do your part. So, 
Let me ask you a question. Do you want to be loved? There's like eight people in this room that want to be loved. <laughs> wow, what do the rest of you want? I'm curious. No, no seriously, do you want to be loved? Yeah. yeah, do you want to be blessed? Yeah. So do you want your relationships to be better or worse? Yeah. Okay, well, if you want it to be better, I'm going to talk about four choices that you need to make every single day that will change your relationships to better if you make the right choice. I mean, if you want it to be worse, you can make that other choice. But, uh, but these are choices that you and I need to make if we're going to have a marriage that is better rather than worse. The first choice is to serve or be selfish. You have to make the choice to serve or be selfish. In other words, is your energy going to be spent on yourself or on your spouse? Because remember, whoever loves his wife loves himself. And, and this is tough because all of us are selfish people. And if that offends you, I, I'm sorry. But the scripture says that there's none righteous, not even one, that all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the very root of sin is selfishness. We act for our own benefit. We act for what we want. I want what I want, and I want it when I want it. And, and that's how selfishness is manifest. And so we have to intentionally decide to act against our natural-born selfish instincts. And, and the way that we do that, it means that we choose to serve. It, it means that we choose to serve our spouse. And if you serve your spouse, you are serving your own interests. Let me say that again. If you decide that you're going to serve your spouse, you're going to be serving your own interests. Because if you are selfish, you sabotage your marriage. If you choose to be selfish, then you are sabotaging your relationship. You see, when we act selfishly, we start thinking in a win-lose mindset. By the way, most of us naturally think in a win-lose mindset because that's what selfishness leads us to. So we want what we want, so we want to get it. So if I win the argument, my spouse loses the argument. That's not really how it happens in our house. I think I've won three times in like 37 years. And I know because I keep track because I'm wrong all the time. Uh, but, you know, we, when, when I win an argument, then my spouse loses. If I get what I want, then my spouse is denied what she wants. If we spend money on the thing that I desire, then she doesn't get to spend it on what she desires. Do you, you see how that works? If there is a win-lose scenario in your relationship, if you win and your spouse loses, then the marriage loses. Okay? If you win and your spouse loses, I don't care what the context is, then the marriage loses. The man who loves his wife loves himself. Why? Why, why is this true? Because of reciprocity. You know, Paul said the man who loves his wife loves himself. Think about it the opposite. The man who hurts his wife hurts himself. The wife who dishonors her husband dishonors herself. The man who betrays his wife betrays himself. See, we need to think differently than what the world teaches us. We need to think about a win-win marriage. In other words, when you think about your relationships, you need to think, how can we both win? It needs to be a win-win because we're in this together and I can't win unless she wins and she can't win unless I win. So we need to have a different way of thinking about that. And the way to get to a win-win is when both husband and wife choose to serve instead of being selfish. Let me say that again. The way you get to a win-win is when both parties decide they're gonna serve the other person. Now, you can't choose for the other party, but you can choose for you. And it's kind of risky because we all want to, you know, take care of ourselves, but that's not in the best interest of ourselves. So, guys, I'm just going to challenge you. God kind of calls you the leader of the family. If you're in a relationship, you start this ball rolling. You decide you're going to break the mold, and you're going to start serving your spouse first. Change that dynamic, because if you want your relationship to be better, you have to choose to serve. Second choice for a better marriage, you're either going to listen or you're going to ignore. Are you going to listen or are you going to ignore? Uh, Jesus said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Isn't that an interesting statement? 
He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was talking about parables, he said, uh, to fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah, you will indeed hear, but never understand, and you will indeed see, but never perceive. Now, I remember the first time I read those, and I was like, okay, you hear, but you don't understand, you see, and you don't perceive, and I don't really how that, understand how that plays out. And by the way, when Jesus said that, he was not referencing marriage at all. But boy, doesn't that sound like it applies? Am I the only one who hears and doesn't understand, who sees and doesn't perceive? Am I the only one who goes to the pantry completely clueless? <laughs> Am I the only one who's thankful that now we can call from the grocery store so we don't have to buy the wrong thing and take it back? See, I, you know, look, I, I just think that passage is not just for husbands, but it really does apply to us. We, we hear and never understand, we see and never perceive. Uh, listen, do you remember in the early days of your relationship when you hung on every word that the other person spoke? Do you, do you remember those days when you, you just wanted to hear their voice and listen to their stories and, and hear all their thoughts and their dreams? And you, Okay, do you remember being the dorks when you were on the phone saying, you know, talking at the conversation? And it's like, you hang up first. No, you hang up first. No, you say goodbye. You know, that's just like a certain generation because now you guys don't talk, you text. But, um, but some of us did that, and it was like so stupid because we didn't want to say goodbye. We wanted to keep talking about nothing. Now, I can literally stand three feet from Merelda and talk to her, and she can be immune to my voice. <laughs> and she can have a whole conversation with me, and I can hear her talking and not understand a single word that she said until she asked, did you hear what I was saying? <laughs> the answer is no, I didn't. I didn't realize you were talking to me. I knew you were talking. I just didn't know it was for me. You see, we choose to ignore, and then we get angry and upset that our spouse didn't hear what we said. See, we want to be heard, but we don't want to listen. It doesn't work that way. If you want your marriage to thrive, then listen. Give them attention. Look, put down the phone or the tablet. Turn off the TV or the PlayStation and give your spouse attention. Listen to them. James uh, chapter 1, the apostle says, all of us should hear this and do this. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Okay, it's James 1.19. A lot of us need to memorize this. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. Most of us are slow to listen, quick to speak, and quick to anger, and wonder why our marriages are struggling. If you want your marriage to be better, you need to listen to your spouse. So choose to listen. Third choice to make your marriage better, you can encourage or you can accuse. You can encourage or you can accuse. Now we could preach an entire sermon series on marriage communication, but I'm just gonna give you the, the simple secret. If you want your marriage to improve, try speaking encouragement. Try speaking encouragement. You will be encouraged. Think about it. The man who encourages his wife will himself be encouraged. Okay? Uh, because of that sin of selfishness that I've already referenced, we tend to speak in accusations. Now, I don't know if you're aware of this or not. I've done enough marriage counseling through the years. I've listened enough. I've repented enough. I've become aware enough of my own tendencies. But we tend to speak in accusations. It's just part of how we're wired because we're selfish and we're self-centered and we're looking at the world like it revolves around us. And so we say things like, why did you do that? Or the, you're doing it wrong. I know you guys have never told each other you're doing something wrong, right? In relationship. Uh, I remember the first time I, I was doing dishes. We were newlyweds. And yes, I do dishes because my mom taught me and she's scary. Uh, so I know how to do dishes and I'm doing dishes and Morella came in and tried to tell me how to do the dishes. And I said, I can either do the dishes or you can do the dishes, but I can't do the dishes with you coaching me. It's not going to work. And she was really wise because she walked out of the kitchen and let me finish the dishes. See, but we tend to speak in accusation. You did it wrong. Or we, or we ask questions that are really accusations. Who ate my ice cream? Right? It's mine. I possessed it. And you ate. You, 
or we use words like this, you never listen to me. You never help with chores. You always ignore me. You always decide where we're going to go. Can I just tell you, if you use the words never and always like that, then that's not really a statement. It's an accusation. And by the way, if you make an accusation, somebody usually defends because they will find that one time that they actually helped with the chores. I took the trash out in June. What are you talking about? You're completely wrong. See? So if you want a marriage with constant conflict, then accuse. But if you want a blessed relationship, encourage. Just encourage. Look, love is patient and love is kind. Are, are you, look, kindness ought to start at home. It's amazing how we can be nice to everybody else and, and rude to the people closest to us. So are your words kind? Are they encouraging? Are they grateful? Are they polite? Do you still use words like please and thank you in your home? Or do you just demand? Or do you ask? See, the Apostle Paul writing to the church in uh, Ephesus, in chapter 4, you can flip over a page if you, if you want to. He said, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. Let no unwholesome speech ever come out of your mouths, but only such as good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. We are never to use our words to tear down. We are to use our words to build up, to encourage. By the way, if you're a follower of Jesus, that's the standard. That, that's God's expectation of us. So if you want your marriage to be better, start encouraging more. It'll change the temperature of the relationship. Fourth choice, if you want a better marriage, you're either going to give grace or you're going to hold a grudge. You're going to give grace or you're going to hold a grudge. Now, in some ways especially if you've been married a long time, marriage is a test of tolerance. You guys know what I'm talking about. You're together a lot in close quarters. You're sharing a house. You're sharing rooms. You're sharing a bed. You're sharing a bathroom. And then you throw into that the stresses of raising children and managing life and, and paying bills and, and going to work. And look, the reality is you're going to offend each other. It's going to happen. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when and how. And by the way, your spouse has the capacity to hurt you more than anyone else in the world. Okay, your spouse has that capacity. They can do that. So they're gonna hurt you. The question isn't whether they're gonna hurt you. The question is how are you gonna respond when they hurt you? How are you gonna respond when they offend you? So are you going to respond with grace and forgiveness and mercy? Or are you going to respond with bitterness and anger and unforgiveness? See, it's easy to become fixated on all the offenses, to focus on their failures over and over and over again. And if you do that, that person that you once loved and promised to love and to cherish till death do you part, they will become evil and despicable. They'll become the spawn of Satan. I know because I've heard them described in my office. See, if, and, and what happens is all you see, all you hear, all you experience is offense. They're always wrong and they're always evil. And what will happen when you make that mental change is your marriage will die. It'll die. And it'll be miserable for a while before it gets there. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 13 said, love keeps no record of wrongs. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Love forgives. So if you choose grace, you're going to live better. If you forgive, especially the little things, if you forgive the little things when the big stuff happens, you'll survive. But if you don't forgive the little things when the big stuff happens, then your marriage will explode. It'll just blow up. It might survive, but it'll be on life support. Grace is so healing. And we are told to forgive as we've been forgiven. I mean, after all, the blood of Jesus, God's Son, cleanses us of all our sin. And if we've been forgiven of all our sin, we're supposed to forgive as we've been forgiven. 
And again, it's really easy to talk about forgiveness out there, but we're talking about forgiveness close up, and that's where it makes a life-changing difference. That's where it makes a relationship-altering difference when you decide you're going to forgive that person who hurt you in those little ways day in and day out. So if you become focused on forgiving, if you become fixated on God's grace for you so much so that it fills your heart and overflows to other people, your relationship will thrive as a place of grace. You'll live in a house of mercy and joy. And the things that would set other couples to arguing and fighting, you'll laugh about because that's what grace does. So choose grace or choose to hold a grudge. One will bless you. So you have the choice to make your marriage better or worse. Like, I'm praying that you choose better. Actually, the entire staff at Calvary is praying that you choose better. We want to see your marriages thrive. It breaks our heart when we see marriages fail. When we see couples giving up, calling it quits, we know that God has the power to heal, and it, and it breaks our heart at that moment. So we want to see you thrive. So we're praying that you will choose better. We're praying that you will choose to serve, to listen, to encourage, and forgive. So, do you want your relationships to be better or worse? <laughs> Less enthusiastic at this point. It's like, you know, after telling us what it's going to take, I think I'm just going to stick with mediocrity. <laughs> you know, we're on a slow downhill crash right now. I think I can just ride that out. Do you want your relationship to be better or worse? Better! Okay, well... If you want it to be better, I got homework for you. Okay, I got assignments. Because here's the, here's the reality. You can listen to the sermon and go, that was a good sermon. Is it good? And you walk out the door and keep living exactly the way you've been living, and nothing will change in your relationship. You have to read and apply God's word for your life to be different, for your relationship to be different. So I've got, look, this is for people who really honestly want their relationship to be better. I've got three assignments that I want you to do in the next seven days. No, I'm not going to check your work. This is between you and God. But three assignments for the next seven days. This is easy. You can do this, okay? Number one, go on a date. Go on a date with your spouse. I, I, I originally said date night, but I realize some of you are too old to stay up that late. So uh, <laughs> just being honest, right? Nine o'clock's a new midnight. But uh, it doesn't matter if it's in the morning. It doesn't matter if it's the afternoon. It doesn't matter if the evening. I want you to do something fun with your spouse. And it, by that, I don't mean taking the grandkids for ice cream or hanging out with a bunch of other couples so that the guys talk to the guys and the girls talk to the girls. I want you to be alone with your spouse doing something you guys enjoy so you can have conversation, okay? So go on a date, number one. Number two, I want you to discuss the vow renewal that we have planned for two weeks from now. On September 4th and 5th, as part of the worship service, we're going to do a vow renewal for all the couples that want to do a vow renewal. And, uh, and, and so I want you to talk about it, because what I don't want to happen is you show up that weekend, and then, you know, guys, you look at her and like, you, you want to do this? And she's already mad at you from what you did last night. And so she's like, I don't want to say yes to you again. And I don't want to start a fight on the day this supposed to be a celebration of marriage. So, uh, so I want you to talk about it. Do we want to do this? Why or why not? Okay, because this is your decision. It's not anybody else's. It's yours, but you got to talk about it. So go on a date, have a discussion about the vow renewal. Third one's going to be a little harder for some of you. I want you as a couple to pray together for each other at least once this week out loud where they can hear it. Out loud. I know some of you right now are going, I, we can't do that. Yes, you can. It's awkward. It'll be uncomfortable, but that's okay. At some point during the week, I want you to take your wife's hand or your husband's hand when they're awake I know what some of you are thinking. <laughs> I want them to hear you pray for them. And, and, and if you don't have a clue what to pray, here's, here's a prayer you can borrow it, okay? God doesn't care. Guys, this is what, what I would encourage you to pray. God, thank you for my wife. Help me to be the husband that you created me to be. Help me to bless her. Let her hear you pray that. Wives, pray something similar for your husbands. You can pray a whole lot more if you want to, but if that's all you get out, that, that alone is healing. Here's why. Because, look, if you're believers, God's already a part of your relationship, but you're praying out loud for each other where you can hear it, you're, you're inviting God to be actively involved in your relationship. Amen. And some of you may find that you like that enough that you do it more than once. But I want you to at least try it 
one time. See if it makes a difference. So there's your, there's your three assignments. But I know some of you are like classic suck-ups from high school. You're not satisfied with 100%. Here's extra credit. Some of you, you know, you got to have 110% or you failed. So uh, here's the extra credit. If you decide that you want extra credit, then talk about these four choices that we framed today. Talk about them in terms of how you personally are doing with them. In other words, don't evaluate your spouse. Evaluate yourself in front of your spouse. It's a confessional conversation. Hey, I think I'm doing pretty good on this. I think I'm failing on this. I need to do better. Then if they're wanting to, they can affirm you or help you see things differently. And then you guys can repent together and plan together to make it better. Here's the reality. Unless you decide that you're going to make it better, it's going to stay like it is or get worse. We want you to choose better. You made the commitment for better or for worse, but that's a choice that God and I hope that you choose better starting right now. Let's pray. Father, thanks for loving us. We don't deserve your love, but you continue to pour it out on us over and over and over again, and you've taught us how to love, and you've called us to love, and you've placed us in families and in relationships where we have an opportunity to love somebody to honor you. And so, God, uh, help us to do that. Help us to love our spouses in a way that blesses us, blesses them, blesses our families, and even proclaims the name of Jesus to a world that doesn't know how to do relationships. God, we want to have such strong marriages and families at Calvary that the people in Lake Havasu are amazed, and they want to know about Jesus because he makes a difference in our homes. So, God, we can't do this without you. Teach us how to love like you created us to love. Teach us how to bless, in Jesus' name, the people that are closest to us so that we can be sons and daughters of the living God and so that we can have homes that are joyful, delightful, and a place of love and grace. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen.